All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started here with our act study. And before we get started, let's spend a few moments of silent prayer. Um, this will give us the opportunity to just examine ourselves, clear our minds, and uh, so that we can be able to concentrate on what God want us to concentrate on this evening. So let's spend a few moments of silent prayer. Um, and then um, maybe I could get Brother Johnny to open us up in prayer. Um, or we can, or if Johnny can do that, that'd be awesome. I would love to. All right. Heavenly Father, it's such a privilege to, to know you and uh, to be blessed with uh, the truth that we have in the word that you have made available to us. And we are so thankful for Keithian um, that you have made available to us to teach us your word. So I thank you for all those that are uh, faithful and uh, all those faithful students that are here and we pray for those that aren't that couldn't make it and we ask that you enable all of us to to concentrate and to focus and to be led by your spirit through your teaching uh, so that we grow in our uh, understanding of you and what you have for us and what you expect of us uh, so that we can serve you be obedient to you and uh, further your plan um, uh, while we're here. And uh, so uh, bless this service and all those in attendance. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. If y'all will, you can open your Bibles to Acts chapter 4, uh, verse 32. Acts chapter 4, verse 32. Well, we're going to continue working our way through um, the book of Acts. We're still in the early stages of this church, um, and we're uh, seeing the ministry of Peter uh, at this particular time in church history. Um, um, we see that the church is primarily made up of Jewish believers. Uh, later, we're going to see that the church is going to include Gentiles as well. And so we'll begin at verse 32. And tonight we're going to go through verse 32 through chapter 5, verse 16. And our title uh, the study tonight, uh, Generosity and Divine Discipline in the Early Church. Generosity and Divine Discipline in the early church. So if I can get someone to read um, verse 32 through 36, and this is the generosity part of this study um, tonight, and then we'll get into chapter five. Can I get a volunteer to read verse 32 through 37? All right. Uh, now the multitude of those who believe were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked for all who were possessors of lands or houses, sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Jesus, who was also named Barabbas, I'm sorry, and Joseph, Joseph, who was also named Barabbas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and bought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. Thank you, Jim. Now, what we're going to begin looking at um, tonight, this passage of scripture have definitely been misinterpreted and misapplied um, throughout um, church history. And, uh, and I just want to probably, you know, try to bring balance here in this passage. Now, the reference in this context 
just to start before we look at the is the church okay the church is um the subject here and and how the early church um conducted themselves amongst each other now this is not a, the state government the state government is not the issue or the subject uh, some people have take um have taken this as being communism uh this cannot be compared to communism in our modern time because this is um the issue here is the church and how the church um fellowship um as they commune with god how they display generosity toward those in the church and so the state government is not involved here uh what encourages uh, you know government you know taking property and dis distributing it um to the poor and to everybody this is not communism in view here we're talking about the church and now let's see the interpretation and the congregation verse 32 of those who believe were of one heart and soul now notice the one heart and soul meaning that these early uh this early community uh believer believer were spiritually unified uh it was a very close-knit social community um and and notice in, in this close-knit uh community came out of their communion and their fellowship with god their communion and fellowship with god led to them being spiritually unified and i want you to notice that fellowship with god lead to intimate fellowship with one another you know uh um fellowship and close community uh in a local assembly is only possible when each individual believer is communing uh, with God and then we're going to see the uh, uh, when believers are communing with God how they're going to be closer knit to one another and, and what we see and not one of them claimed that anything belonged to him was his own but all things were common property to them so look at the believers uh, way of thinking because of the impact God grace have had on their life. And so now that they have been impacted by the grace of God through Jesus Christ, everything that their mindset was everything that I have and everything that I am is a result of the grace of God. And as a result, nothing that I own belongs to me. That's the mindset they have as a result of coming in contact with the grace of God through the message of Peter and John in this early uh, uh, stage here. And so that was their attitude. Uh, and see the Christian church should share in common wealth. And we do as uh, we, in, in other words, when me as a believer, I remember when I first got saved and I start really growing in the word and realizing what God have done for me freely from his grace, uh, I became a uh, mentally, I wanted to respond to that grace first in my love and commitment to God and my obedience. But I became gradually over time, uh, as I contemplated the grace of God toward me, over time, I became a very generous person uh, because I realized that everything that I am and everything that I have is a result of the grace of God. And, and in other words, when I see my brother in need, uh, I, I don't look at it as though what I have belongs to me, what I have belongs to God, and God have blessed me with so much, and I can't even pay him back for what he have done for me, but the least that I could do is show my appreciation for grace by also helping those who are in need within the, the local assembly. 
And, and that is the response of communing with God, realizing his grace as you become gracious toward those in the local assembly of brothers and sisters in Christ who has a need. Now, and, this, and, and, and notice in verse 33, and with great power, the apostle were given testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and abundant grace was upon them all. So this abundant grace was upon them. And, and this is the, and watch the response of grace. For there was not a needed person among them. For all who were owners of land, uh, or owners of land or real estate or houses would sell them and bring the, the proceed of the sales and lay them at the apostle feet. And they would be disputed to each as any had need. Now the church did not make it a law. Uh, or requirement did not coerce these believers to sell their real estate uh, or engage in communism to help those believers who are in need. They did this of their own free will uh, in response to the grace. Their mentality had changed. They no longer thought that what they have, they earned or they deserved. They start realizing that I, all, everything I have is a result of the grace of God. And therefore they wanted to help those within the local assembly of believers or local community of believers who had a need and they did of their own uh, free will. This was not um, anyone taking anything from them, making it a law or anything like that. And, and, and so and what I want you to uh, also keep in mind is that these believers who sold their real estate, they had open hearts. Um, and whenever you have an open heart, you got an open pocket. Uh, when there's a true Christian need, your pocket just opens. Um, and a closed heart will close its pocket when a believer is in need. See, communion with God and fellowship leads to open hearts. When we have been shown so much grace, it motivates our hearts uh, to open in generosity as did these believers right here. I think the grace of God was what they were responding to and not coercion or being forced. And that comes from each individual believer. And, 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 and one of these believers that responded was Barnabas. Uh, and remember later, he's going to become a traveling, a travel, traveling companion with Paul. And he probably funded a lot of the, uh, the work, missionary work of the apostle Paul, uh, not under coercion, but in response to the grace of God. And apart from grace orientation, there is no sharing with other believers. There is no sharing with other believers unless we have a grace attitude about everything that we are and everything we is and everything we have is a result of the grace of God. And then in verse uh, 36, now, uh, uh, now notice uh, Barnabas is called the son of encouragement, son of encouragement, um, and who owned a track of land, sold it and brought it money and laid it at the apostle feet. Now we'll go to chapter five. Uh, we'll go to chapter five now. Can I get a volunteer to read uh, chapter five, verse one through six? One through six. All right. So, go ahead. Yeah, I, I can get it. Chapter All right. Five, one through six. But a certain man named Ananias with his wife, Sapphira, sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself and his and his wife's with his wife's full knowledge and bringing a portion of it he laid it at the apostles feet but peter said ananias why has satan filled your heart to lie to the holy spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land while it remained unsold did it not remain your own and after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, 
but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last, and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard of it. Okay, verse 6. And the young men arose and covered him up, and after carrying him out, they buried him. Okay, now here we see uh, discipline in the early church. Um, and Ananias with his wife Sapphira, okay? Now, verse 2 say, and kept back some of the price for himself. Kept back, if it reference to taking portion of the whole of something. So uh, they sold their property and they kept back the whole of their property, but they wanted the apostle Peter to think or give them credit for the whole, though they gave him only a part of it. Now, this was their property. No one forced them. No one told them they had to sell their property and give it to the church. They did this of their own free will, and they uh, uh, kept back a uh, portion of it, uh, which is embezzling. Uh, they took uh, part of it. They kept it for themselves, um, and it was a you know form of greed. Uh, that wasn't the the main issue here. The main issue was not necessarily them them keeping back portion of it. You know, it was there. They could do whatever they want. They can sell it or not sell it. But they chose to sell their land, um, and and they chose and, and to hold back some of it but they wanted in deception and hypocrisy, they wanted the apostle and others to see them as giving the whole. So that is deceit and that is lying. And so that was the primary issue here is deceit and lying. Uh, wanted to get credit for giving whole and lying. And they said they kept back. Now this was kind of like the, the greed of Achan uh, in Joshua chapter 7, 1 through 26. Um, now, this is not the, the uh, uh, well, look at verse 12. And they brought portion of it, and he laid at the apostle's feet, as though he was given the whole thing, that the whole price of what he sold the, the, the property for. And verse 3 said, but Peter said, Ananias. Why have Satan fill your heart to lie? In other words, the person who was influencing Ananias to uh, deceive by lying in his greed was Satan. Satan was influencing him to deceive by lying to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land. Now, they had right to keep the price of the land you know, whatever they wanted, they could have kept it. But then he say, um, and they had the freedom to do that, uh, to sell. But look what he's saying, verse four, while it remained unsold, before you even sold your property, before you even sold it, did it not remain your own? It was yours. And after it was sold, was it not under your control? You could have did whatever, yes, yes, it, you could have did whatever you wanted to do with it. Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but God. So here we have the sin of uh, Ananias was the sin of greed uh, uh, or the sin of deception, the sin of lying. Okay. Uh, Ananias wanted part of his money, but he wanted credit as given all. This was hypocrisy. This was hypocrisy. In verse 5, and as he heard these words, Ananias fell down, breathed his last, and great fear came all who heard it. So here we see that they tried to um, do a good, I mean, they tried to do a good thing, but they tried to balance that good thing with evil. They tried to balance that good thing with evil. And see, God cannot balance evil with good. And so he's not going to uh, deal with, so here we see hypocrisy, which should show that God hates 
stage plan or hypocrisy. He wants the truth, but they chose to lie and deception. And, uh, and that was the sin. They could have did whatever they wanted to do with their property, but it was the deception. It was trying to get credit as given all, but yet keep back some because of greed. Greed and the desire for gain can cause a person to be dishonest. And that is the issue here. Now, verse seven, now there eclipsed an interval of about three hours and his wife came in not knowing what had happened. And Peter responded to her, tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, yes, that was the price. Then Peter said to her, why is it that you have agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out as well. So what we see here is that Ananias and, Ananias and his uh, uh, and Sapphira, they had discussed this matter together and they both agreed to deceitfully try to, to deceive the apostle uh, and make him think or the church think that they had given the whole thing with that with deceit and being dishonest in their greed. And that's what greed does. Greed calls individuals, even Christian, uh, to be dishonest. Um, and so, you know, what I, something that I realized here is that when you're married, there are times where we have to disagree with our spouse. We're to disagree with our spouse or if you're married or whatever. Whenever there's uh, uh, a Whenever uh, agreeing will cause us to sin or be dishonest, then we're to disagree. We're to disagree. Anytime we're being incurred by our spouse to sin, we are to disagree uh, in our commitment to the Lord. And uh, so, uh, so the issue here is sin. They could have did whatever they wanted to do with their property, but the issue was sin. Uh, of greed and lying and deception and wanting to get credit as though they have given all. Now, verse uh, uh, 10, and immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last and a young man came in and found her dead and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. So here we see um, uh, that as a result of the love of money, these uh, believer was subtracted from the local church. They were subtracted. Just imagine um, if uh, their sin was allowed to exist in his early church, we probably would not even have chapter five to be a blessing and encouragement to us today. But we see here that God judge or dealt with this sin uh, and it should warn anybody as a believer of hypocrisy as though God cannot see deception. He can. Uh, we are always to be truthful and do the right thing uh, in the eyes of the Lord. Um, and uh, in verse 11, and great fear came over the whole church and over all who heard of these things. And so the church is being purged here with judgment on this sin. This is a subtraction. And I, 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 you know, what came to my mind when these believers were subtracted from this local church is how sometimes we think that if a local assembly lose members, then there's something that the local church is not doing. And that may not always be the case. Sometimes certain people have to be removed from the midst of a growing church uh, in order for that church to remain pure and holy and be able to continue to grow, grow in power. And this church is, is because of, you know, this church discipline 
is going to win multiple multitude is going to come to believe in Jesus Christ because others are going to witness the power of the spirit in this church. And therefore, many of them are going to believe when they see the power of God being displayed. In verse 12, at the hands of the apostle, many signs and wonder were taking place among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon Portico or on this porch. Uh, but none of the rest dared to associate with them or approach them. However, the people held them in high esteem. And all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number. So notice it have went now, the church have went now from 120 to 3,000 to 5,000 and now a multitude. So the church is growing rapidly. But even in the midst of this rapid growth, there is some subtraction from the membership because of sin and dishonesty and greed, uh, which can hinder uh, the power and the work of the spirit within the local assembly. So sometimes uh, God may have to remove individual uh, from the local assembly through discipline. And, and then the church just continued to make an impact in the world. Now notice uh, verse 15, to such an extent that they even carried the sick out into the streets and laid them on cots and pallets so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on one of them. Now, it is not Peter's shadow in itself that healed the sick. It was the power of God that was operating in and through Peter uh, that were bringing healing to these individuals to draw their minds and heart toward the gospel message. Verse 16, also the people from the cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together, bringing people who were sick or afflicted with unclean spirit, and they were all being healed by the power of God. So here you see a church functioning in the power of God, and it is through God's power that men's are being saved and being brought to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So now that's the church discipline section. So since we got um, 30 more minutes, we'll go into the testing of the church. And now the church is about to be tested. And you better believe whenever uh, a church is growing in number or, or the power of God is functioning in a local assembly, you better believe that that becomes a threat to Satan's program in the world. Therefore, the church is about to be tested. Ultimately, this is going to lead to persecution. And the goal of persecution is to hinder the progression of a church that is walking by God's power. So believe it or not, y'all, uh, if, if your church or your local assembly is learning how to walk in God's power, you better believe there are going to be opposition. Uh, and that opposition is designed out of jealousy to hinder the progression of that local assembly because of the impact that that local assembly or that church is making in the world. And so we all should be on the lookout for what we're about to see, testing. And testing is going to come. We just have to be on the alert. Verse 17, the testing of the early church. But the high priest rose up along with all of his associates. That is the set of the Sadducee, and they were filled with jealousy. Now notice jealousy. Now jealousy here is resentment. So resentment because of the success of the church. So we see a strong resentment here because of the success of others, the local assembly. And most of the time, this persecution or suppression is gonna be due to losing power and influence over people. And what always is tied to their love for money, their love for money. And when you got control over people that brought gain and these uh, religious leaders uh, were losing influence over people and they were losing power and probably money. And as a result, uh, we gotta suppress 
um, the spread of this new religion is growing. And they became jealous, filled with resentment of the success of others. And then it's saying, verse 18, they laid hands on the apostles and put them in a public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the gates of the prison and taken them out. He said, go or resume, stand and speak to the people in the temple, the whole message of this life. So the, the Holy Spirit sent by God, sent by Jesus Christ at the right hand of God, the father sent him to open the prison gates for the apostles and 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 told him y'all resume continue to speak verse 21 uh, upon hearing this they entered the temple about daybreak and began to teach now when the high priest and his associate came they called the council together even all the senate of the sons of israel and sent orders to the prison house for them to be brought but the officer who came did not find them in the prison and they returned and reported back saying, we found the prison house locked quite securely and the guards standing at the doors. But when we had opened up, we found no one inside. Now, when the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests held these words, they were greatly perplexed about them as to what would come of this. In other words, what would this become if we allowed this to continue or go on but someone came and reported them the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people then the captain went along with the officer and proceeded to bring them back without violence for they were afraid of the people that they might be stoned now so here we see god expanding his church through spirit-filled believers who with boldness face opposition of these leaders who were motivated by jealousy. They're losing power, but yet the Holy Spirit said nothing's going to hinder God's work. Free, I mean, the, 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 uh, and the Jesus freed these men. And now they're out doing what God have called them to do with boldness, uh, knowing that they're doing the will of God. Verse 28 uh, say, we gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name. And yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man blood upon us. But Peter and the apostle answered, we must obey God rather than man. I love this right here. We must obey God's rules and not you guys rules. The God of our father raised up Jesus, whom you put to death by hanging him on a tree. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as prince and savior. So God have lifted up Jesus to the right, his right hand. He's the prince and savior and grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. And we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Now watch this. But when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and intend to kill them. They were infuriated. And they said, we're going to kill them. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, now he was a very respected uh, teacher amongst the Pharisees. He was a teacher of the law, respected. And they say he stood up in the council and gave order to put the men outside for a short time. And he said to them, men of Israel, take care what you propose to do with these men. Now look how God is motivating um, this man to intercede for the apostle to further the work of God. For some time ago, Thedius rose up claiming to be somebody in a group of about 400 men joined up with him. But he was killed and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away some people after them him he too perished and all those who followed him were scattered so in the present case i say to you stay away from these men and let them alone for if this plan or action is of men it will be overthrown but if it is of god you will not be able to overthrow them or else you may even be found fighting against god man i love that 
So many amongst the religious leader were actually fighting against God in their jealousy, and they did not even know it. Uh, uh, man's arrogance would bring him low. This, this verse brought me to uh, a scripture in Proverbs came to my mind that man's arrogance will bring him low. And we see that in arrogance, men try to overthrow the plan of God and try to hinder the work of God working in and through the apostle in disseminating the gospel. But they don't realize by trying to overthrow this work of God that they're actually fighting against God. And, and, and that is going to bring them low. But in their arrogance, they are fighting against God. Verse 4 to say, they took his advice. And after calling the apostles in, they flogged them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then released them. So they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. I love that phrase. I highlight it, suffer shame for his name. And see, we all should consider it a privilege to suffer for the name of Jesus. The Christian life and the, the uh, disseminating God's word sometime is going to be faced with opposition. But we should consider it a privilege to suffer as Jesus suffered, John the Baptist suffered, the apostles suffered. They all suffered shame for the name of Jesus, and they considered it a privilege. Verse 42. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Most believers were probably been on gave up and throw the towel in and say, I'm not going to do what God wants me to do because of all the opposition. But these believers, uh, they did what God wanted to do, even if it will jeopardize their life. And, and, and in other words, the religious leaders say, stop talking about Jesus. Stop talking about Jesus. Stop. And you know what? Most people, especially in our time, they would do it. They would not proclaim. You know, I'm going to be honest with you. If I was working in the school system, public school system, I know I'll get fired. I'll probably get fired. <laughs> If I was to get hired today, I'd probably be fired probably tomorrow because they don't want you to speak about Jesus. Um, but I know I will get fired. I'll get fired because I'm going to speak about Jesus because that is what we're called to do. That is the Great Commission. I remember one time working for a organization that when, uh, early on, it was a missionary organization. And, and, and I was a missionary and I used to share the gospel in this building complex where our missionary office was at. And I used to, everybody that I came in contact with, I used to look for opportunity to just start a conversation with them, to share the gospel with them. And end up, they went and reported me to my superior at this organization. Well, the superior went and talked to the, um, the guy who, ministry it was and he communicated to the manager that i was under and they told me now this is a missionary organization they told me while i'm on the clock i can no longer minister or evangelize while i'm on the clock i can't witness to anybody in that building you know what i knew when they did that i said it would not be law <laughs> It was, it, it would not be long before God going to remove me from this ministry if I can't share the gospel with everybody I come in contact with when I'm on the clock from eight to five. Yeah, I understand that I'm there to work, but my job, I am a missionary and, and, and you are a missionary as an organization and you're supposed to be sharing your faith as well. And so if I go to the bathroom and run to run and in, run into someone and have a conversation with them and they want to talk about football and family and this and that, oh, I'm going to find an opportunity to see where they're at spiritually and share the gospel with them. But then when I go to talking about spiritual thing, they want to go and 
um, uh, uh, try to hinder me from sharing my faith. Well, guess what happened? My ministry, Grace Prison Ministry, were birthed out of that because I became very dissatisfied, unhappy being there. And then God used a letter from an inmate that, and the letter stated, we need in this prison on a regular basis, sound Bible teaching, the teaching that you guys are sending us in these prisons. And from that letter, I heard God saying, I want you to go back into the prison. Put in my notice, told a lot of my friends, they began to donate for me to go forward, um, go part-time and the rest is history. And now from that opposition, God have uh, 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 won thousands of people throughout the world to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ through that opposition. Can I get an amen? <laughs> God is good. And we have to do what God wants us to do, no matter what, no matter what. All right. So let's move. Let's move on. Let's go to let's go to uh, chapter six now. Any any questions or comment? Any questions or comment from where we're at so far before we we go on? Any questions or comment? I, I just appreciate your example of modern day persecution um, for speaking God's truth is still playing out like it did in Acts. The, the persecution of the early church resulted in the spread of the gospel. And your, your example goes to show that 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 is that still god still uses it today to continue spreading the good news amen you know john at the moment it hurt at me i was very hurt by it i was very hurt by it but at the same time god molded used that to prepare my heart for when that time come to hear his call and, and, and if it wasn't for that, I probably would not have been sensitive to God's call. Yeah. And my favorite verse is Romans uh, 8, 28. And God caused that for his good, man. God yeah. caused all things to work together for good for those who love him. Amen. Those who are called according to his name. Yep. Amen. Any other question or comments? I think you probably had about 10 amens, but you had us all muted. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, that's that's awesome. Awesome. Well, praise the Lord. Well, let, let's let's look at a couple more things if if and no more comments. Any more comments? All right. Well, let's go to chapter six. We won't try to look at everything here because we may end up going into some other subjects and not be able to finish. But we'll start at verse one of chapter six. Now at this time, while the disciple were increasing in number, now notice that the disciple were increasing in numbers. A complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews. Now the Hellenistic Jew was Jew from the dispersion who were in Jerusalem um, to celebrate the festival of Passover and Pentecost against the native Hebrew because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the 12 summoned the congregation of the disciple and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. So here we see leaders are being selected based on maturity. Notice here, this is where we get the pr principles of deacons from. Uh, leaders were selected based on maturity and their relationship with the Holy Spirit. This is, this is so powerful here because in our day and time, we don't always choose leadership based on spiritual maturity and based on people's relationship with the Holy Spirit. We choose based on 
uh, um, their status in the community. And we don't, we tend to overlook the spiritual aspect of uh, uh, the qualification of serving and the apostle can really gives us some really good advice uh, or leadership here and we select people to serve um, who, who may not be called to teach the word of God when we like deacons we're to choose seven men of good reputation in other words if they got good reputation that means that they're uh, live in the spiritual life. These men are living a spiritual life. They are spiritual mature. Nothing bad can be said about them uh, uh, by those in the community, those around them. Um, and they're full of the spirit. Notice the uh, they were full of the spirit and of wisdom. And these are uh, characteristics of spiritual mature believers. Uh, they're selected into the leadership. Uh, and that is what we're to chew based on uh, that, why, that, that, you know, we're to give people time to grow in our local assembly. Yes, we can see a lot of human characteristics and certain believers, but we have to make sure that these believers are growing um, uh, before we put them in positions of leadership. But then in verse four, but we would devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word of God. So notice the apostle gave their whole time to spiritual leadership. In other words, they said, we don't need to spend too much time on serving tables or neglect God's word to serve table. We need to raise up mature believers who may not be called to a teaching ministry. Um, uh, they may be called to evangelize. All believers are called evangelize, but um, uh, we're going to keep devoting ourselves to prayer. I love their single-mindedness and their narrow vision. Uh, and they realize that we need to pray. We need to continue to communicate with God. And we need to allow God to communicate with us in his word. And we need to communicate what God is communicating to us with others. That is our ministry. Our ministry is not to be serving tables. And so they chose men who could handle that. And that's what deacons are called to do is assist the elders in the minor tasks of local church function. All right, let's go to the next verse. The statement found approval with the whole congregation. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, um, Procurus, Nicanor, Tima, Perminus, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And these they brought before the apostle, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. And this is where we get the ordination, the ordination, ordination um, concept from where you uh, pray and lay hands on men who you are uh, 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 promoting to leadership uh, within the local assembly. Verse 7, the word of God kept on spreading, and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great men of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of the grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. But some men from what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, including both Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and some from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and argued with Stephen, but they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly induced man to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous word against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the tribe, and they came up to him and dragged him away and brought him before the council. They put forward false witnesses who said this man in, 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 uh, in, uh, set incessantly speaks again this holy place in the law for we have heard him say that this nazarene jesus would destroy this place and alter the customs with moses handed down to us and fixing their gaze on him all who were sitting in the council saw his face like the face of an angel so what we're about to see is opposition is about to intensify against this new church just like 
opposition progressively intensified in Jesus' ministry. And so I close with this point here is that when a church began to walk in God's power and people began to be added to the number of that church, opposition and persecution is going to come. So we have to be aware of that, uh, and, and that Satan is filled thread with God's program. And so he's going to raise up unbelievers uh, to attack and try to neutralize and bring to a stop uh, the spread of Christianity. So when we come back, we'll begin to look at the uh, uh, persecution. And, and again, God is going to use even persecution because at this particular time, uh, the Great Commission is prim primarily going on within Jerusalem. But through this persecution that we're going to see in chapter 7, the gospel, the believer is going to have to scatter to Judea, Samaria, which that was God's plan anyway. God's plan was for the church to leave from the confines of, Ju uh, of Jerusalem and spread the gospel to the neighboring countries and then ultimately through the apostle Paul to the world. And so God is going to use the wrath of man to praise him as he have done throughout history. He would use man's wrath to disseminate his message throughout the world. All right, we'll stop right here. And uh, any, any more questions or comment before we close in prayer? All right. I can't. Very uh, good. Oh, go ahead, Jim. I'm uh, right. just saying, very good. Amen. All right. Well, oh, yeah. Jim, if you don't mind, you can close us out in prayer, please. All right. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege we have to gather and for your word. And I thank you for Keithian and each and every family represented. I praise you for their healing. I ask that you will guide us and direct us in all that we say and do, that everything that is said will glorify the name of Jesus Christ. Continue to watch over this nation and our leadership. Continue to bless all of our brothers and sisters in Christ. I pray for every person, Father, that uh, is dealing with health issues. I pray for their healing. And I thank you for this healing in advance. And we give you all the honor, the praise, and the glory. And we bind it in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. All right. Y'all have a good night. Have a blessed one. Bye.